out loud. And that was uh, uh, such a blessing. The best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for such a time as this. Thank you, Lord, that we get to uh, press in, take another step forward in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be in your presence, Lord, because of your sacrifice on the cross. The curtain was torn in half. And, Lord, we don't have to go through anybody but you. We can come to you. We can come straight into your presence. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love this morning. Lord, I pray that as we open your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would change us from the inside out. Lord, the words that I say and the, and the things that I bring this morning, get me out of the way today. And your, may your spirit, Lord, we give you full 100% permission, Lord, to do what I could never do, and that's change hearts and lives. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear today. We give it to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I'm so glad that you are sticking with us in this sermon series entitled The Great Adventure, A Journey Through the Book of Acts. And, and I, I'm just uh, grateful. It is uh, a challenging uh, last couple weeks as we've opened up the book of Acts, the account of the first church, and today we get to be uh, in Acts chapter 8. So you can go ahead and turn there now. Uh, we're going to address the end of Acts chapter 7 from last week, and that's what we're going to start this morning. This is where we left off. We kind of left it hanging uh, if you don't know the story. Uh, and so it's Acts chapter 7. We're starting in verse 54. Okay, here we go. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him. They were, they were bum-rushing Stephen here. And verse 58, and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Uh, taking off their coats and placing it before Saul, who was the one that signed off and consented the penalty of stoning. That was a symbol of taking the coats off. That was a symbol, placing it at the feet of the person making that decision. And then, of course, to unrestrict in throwing rocks in the penalty of stoning. Verse 59, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. And with that, he died. I, I just want us to kind of feel the weight. We're kind of getting in the story this morning. In, in what the first church witnessed here in this moment. And with that, he died. <clears throat> the question or questions that may be in our minds and hearts, how is the church going to continue to grow and flourish after witnessing this brutal death? Stephen. What was just witnessed, what we just read, how, how was the church going to rebound from this? And yet again, a new level of fear and uncertainty fell upon the first church. And how was the church going to respond and recover and continue? The title of my message this morning is Scattered But Not Shattered. Scattered But Not Shattered. Shattered, said this way, tested, but not defeated. And I mentioned last week that what we continue seeing in our journey through the book of Acts are firsts of many things. Uh, Stephen is known as the 
first church martyr. The first one killed because of his faith in Christ. That's difficult for you and I to understand how and why this happened. Could this have been prevented? I mean, couldn't Stephen just have gone with the flow of cancel culture? I mean, if only Stephen kept his mouth shut. You know, isn't our faith meant to be kept private anyways? Was the temper tantrum by the religious leaders even necessary? Can't just everyone get along already? You know, so many questions, so many lingering thoughts, and the weight upon the church in this moment. So many things to think, and when it's all said and done, as you unpeel the onion, eventually you'll get to the core, the core of your heart and the core of my heart. What do you see? What do I see? What do you hope to see? What does God see? I want to ask for some interaction here. I addressed this a little bit last week, but what would you say is one of the main goals of the enemy? What is one of the main goals of Satan against you and upon your life? Talk to me. What is it? Distraction. That's big. Fear. Weakened our witness. Yes. Separation from God. Deceit. Say again. Delusion. Lies. Anything else? All those are are right. All those are correct, very accurate. I'd like to say it this way, that one of the main goals of the enemy, of Satan against you, is this. It is to get you to stop. It is, it is, to, it is to get you to stop. To stop you from believing and, and following Jesus. To get you to stop asking God for more. To, to stop growing and changing into the image of Jesus. To have you stop praying. To have you stop serving God. To get you to stop sharing God's love, which is life. To get you to stop connecting and growing with one another in a church family. They're all hypocrites, so you don't need them. To have you stop growing in community with one another. To steal, kill, and destroy to get you to stop. This is one of the main goals of Satan in this hour right now. To get you to stop. You know, the history of the church has been based on this premise since the very beginning, over 2,000 years now, scattered but not shattered. Scattered but not shattered. Tested but not defeated. And if the church had had a theme song, I was thinking about this this past week. If it ever had a theme song, uh, many songs, we sang some of them this morning. This is the song that Holy Spirit gave me as I was uh, doing a deep dive in Acts chapter 8. If it ever had a song, it would be the song by Chumbawamba titled, I Get Knocked Down. Okay, have you heard that song? Okay, do you want to sing it? I get knocked down. You're never going to get, come on, we can do this. All right, here we go, we're going to do this. I'm leading worship. (laughs) Awesome. All right, that's the only time, Cassandra. All right, so I get, but I get up again. You're never going to, yes. Okay, now you're going to be, you're going to be listening to that all week. I was, I literally sang it all week in my car, like singing it, didn't care who was seeing me in my car. Um, This is true. Theme song. Theme song. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down in Jesus' name. You're never going to keep me down. Jesus said it this way. In Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church and all, say all, all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not 
conquer it. How many of you know that you serve a victorious God? Nothing will stop his church. And Jesus is saying that though he were rejected, arrested, and tried, and found innocent, and then crucified anyway, it would not stop him from building his church. God will never give up on his church. But said this way, God's church is not in trouble, man's church is. God's church is not in trouble, man's church is. God, look at the depths of our hearts today. We pray, Father, that you would challenge and change us. Father, convict us, correct us, and look at the depths of our hearts in Jesus' name. What is needed in this hour, what is needed in order for you and me to not give up, to not stop in Jesus' name? For such a time as this, that we're living, we're breathing, in a time when everything is against you. And I'm saying this, it's true. We know it's read in the scriptures prophetically, it will get worse. But do not lose heart, church. God is with us. And so I want us, I want to leave some questions for us to consider this morning. What is needed in order for you and me to not give up, to not stop in Jesus' name? And we're going to jump right into the deep end. Without the water wings, without anything, we're just going to jump right in. Is that okay? All right. It's good. We're not going to sugarcoat it. Here's the first question. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? The faith journey that you and I are on as we look back and reflect at the first church, the faith journey is meant to walk lightly. It's, it's meant to be without burden. In fact, Jesus said it this way, that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This, is one, this was one of the most frustrating, like discouraging uh, scripture passages, how can his yoke be easy, how can his burden be light when everything is heaping weight on your heart and on your mind and on your soul? But we've seen the things that weigh down God's people, the church. We've seen what weighs down the church in hypocrisy. We've seen that division and discord weighs the church down. Jealousy, we talked about this last week. A church club mentality also weighs the church down. A pretend life weighs you and me down. And also slander. And so we are also weighed down when we harbor resentment and blame. This is the opposite of forgiveness. Who do you need to forgive today? Who do I need to forgive C.S. Lewis said it this way, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have someone or something to forgive. You see, God knew what was coming upon the church, that there would be a perfect purpose and a, and a perfect plan in the midst of Stephen's brutal, brutal death. It's hard enough to witness the uh, martyrdom and even read about it of Stephen, let alone his prayer as he was being pummeled by rocks. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. How could Stephen even be praying that? You see, Stephen lived out the way of Jesus to the end. This was in fact what Jesus did on the cross as he was being crucified and brutally beaten, killed, as if they were going to shut him up because they didn't want to hear the truth anymore. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them 
for they do not know what they are doing. And in a prophetic way, Stephen would pave the way for the church to continue the way forward in how to treat those who persecute and those who mock and those who try to separate you and me. This was going to be the template, to pray for them and not withhold forgiveness in our mind and in our hearts. Who do you need to forgive today? Acts 8, verse 1, Saul, and yes, we'll get to this in a bit down the road, Saul being the one who is Paul, his name being changed, Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. What happened? A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Who do you need to forgive today? My, uh, I, I never really had a relationship with my grandfather. The last couple of weeks I've, I've shared with you and invited you into a little bit of my story and my grandmother and what God did with her. Um, I didn't have a relationship with my grandfather, really. Uh, not, not what we, uh, Kara and I, not, not what we've uh, attempted to have with our, grand, our, our, our kids, our boys. <laughs> Is there news to be? <laughs> All right. Um, but to have a relationship with their grandpas, grandfathers. And, uh, but I, I didn't have that, I didn't have that relationship. And my, my, my grandma, as I shared that picture with you last week, uh, my grandmother and grandfather, um, they divorced when my dad was uh, very young, I think nine years old. And so I knew my grandparents as, uh, right, I had, I had two sets of grandparents there. And my grandfather, uh, bless his heart, he he served in World War II, and he received the uh, Purple Heart Award. Uh, he was a prisoner of war, a POW. And, uh, and, I, and I remember when my grandfather died, I was a senior in high school, uh, just confessing with, uh, to you, <coughs> when my grandfather died, uh, there was this a thing in my heart where I said, I'm, I'm glad he's burning in hell now. And, and the reason is because um, the, the times I interacted with my grandfather, the relationship that I had was, was, was not fun. He, most likely because of what he experienced being a POW, prisoner of war, uh, he, he was very psychologically damaging to people. And, and he made it a plan that every time my sister and I would go visit, uh, he, he, it was like a goal of his to, to psychologically damage me. And so there, there was, it, was an, it was not a good relationship. It was, it was, it was just bizarre. And one of the things that uh, my grandfather did, he actually collected coins and there were a few times when he would tell my sister and I, hey, I've got money for you guys. I, I want you guys uh, to enjoy the money that I have. And he had these big, like, bottles and of, like, just coins. Like, I'm talking, like, quarters and half dollars and even $1 coins. And, and so he would, that was just kind of a regular thing. And this one time, I, I just, like, burned in my mind even to this day. Uh, he he said, okay, I got money for you guys. Okay, okay, beg. And, and we would have to, like, bark. Like, the more he would sort of, you know, see that, he'd be like, okay, how much do you want? You, you, I got money for you. <clears throat> and so he would run in this back room and come out with this, you know, just huge bottle of, of just coins. And he'd, and he'd spread it out into the middle of the living room and say, okay, get, get your coins, get your money, get your money. I remember my sister and I like putting it in our pockets and our shirts and our hands and we were collecting. And in the middle of that, he screamed, stop. And it, w- it was just like, whoa. 
and he says, stop stealing my money. And I just remember, like, I just burned in my eyes. It feels like it even just happened yesterday. And, and it, it was just like this, this, this pinnacle moment where I said, I hate this man. How dare him? And that pretty much changed moving forward because that was a regular thing. And when he passed senior in high school, when I was a senior in high school, um, you know, I, I pretty much didn't think much about him anymore. I figured, well, I figured, you know, at least my life is, is better now because he's not here. And years later, not even thinking about my grandfather at all, I was mowing the lawn, and I had some music playing. It might have been Chumbawamba. I don't know, maybe. And I, I, I like literally, I just, it was one of the few times that I heard the audible voice of the Lord. But at first, I, I, I discredited that that was God's voice because I heard, why do you hate me? And as I was mowing the lawn, I, I remember like looking back as if somebody was right there saying, why do you hate me? And I dismissed it. Must have been the pizza I ate the day before. And so I just continued on. And I'm not even kidding. A minute or two later, it was louder. Why do you hate me? I mean, at this point, I'm turning off my chumbawamba, and I'm, I'm, Lord, I said, I got to stop mowing the lawn. And literally, uh, the third time, why do you hate me? And at this point, the third time, I mean, when God wants to speak to you, uh, he will ask you that third time, boy, you just know. And at that point, I'm like, okay, Lord, I know that that's you. What do you mean, do I hate you? And uh, it, was, it was as if this verse, go ahead, Connor, put up 1 John chapter 4. This, this came to me, 1 John chapter 4. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. And that was immediate. The Lord said, why do you hate me? And the last person I thought as I was going through the inventory list really quick, I had already tuned out my grandfather. He was gone in my mind. And then slowly the spirit of the Lord just whispered to me, you have never thanked your grandfather. And I'm like, well, I'm having this argument now in the middle of my lawn. Like, what do you mean? And uh, the Lord said, you've, you've never given any kind of gratitude to your grandfather, the fact that you have freedom right now mowing this lawn, you've never thanked your grandfather. I mean, at this point now, I, I got to have a conversation with the Lord. I, I mean, I remember like, like going into the quietness of my bedroom at that point, and I said to the Lord, how dare you? How dare you? Bring to my mind and heart a man that psychologically abused him. I hate him, and I am justified. I have every reason to stay in my hate for him. And the Lord said, son, we got to go on a journey. And for the next three days, I battled with the Lord. And I said, I, I don't, he's tuned out. In fact, I'm not even going to see him again. And the Lord started gently walking me through a process of healing that I never even was looking for. And the Lord said, son, I'll give me your hate. I want to take the hate you have for your grandfather, and I want to bring you to a place of forgiveness. And, and guys, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been in that place. Or, or right now, you may be thinking in your own life of somebody that you need to forgive you may be thinking like me, absolutely not. I'm not going there. But the Spirit of the Lord wants to do healing in your heart. And in my heart, the Lord started just gently taking me to this place where he started revealing to me, actually, this, that your grandfather was, was broken. At age 19, he was, he was serving and fighting for your freedom. He had a perfect mind. 
and through being a prisoner of war, his mind was destroyed. And he was never the same. Hurt people hurt people. And the Lord was starting to gently just take me to this place of being able to forgive him. And, in fact, there will be a reunion. The Lord showed me that he had accepted Christ. He made a decision towards the end of his life, my grandfather. And I get to see him. And, and I, I remember after that three days of just battling and not sleeping and lots of tears and lots of anger and all of that, I had to go tell my dad what, the, what God did. And I couldn't keep it inside, and so I had to share with him. I shared with him the whole thing, and now we're both crying and, and just in tears. God's, God's healing me, and he's healing my dad at the very same time. And, 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 I, and I said, Dad, do you have something that I can remember grandfather? Because when he passed, I, d I didn't want to have anything to do with that. But now the Lord has really softened my heart and brought me to this place of forgiveness. And my dad said, well, yeah, Grandpa collected coins. I said, that's right. <laughs> and uh, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to you tomorrow, and, um, and we'll put a hole in it, and you can put it, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put it on my, my keys, just like that. Here's the thing. Uh, this doesn't really mean much to you all, but it's it very significant to me. I, I keep this on my keys, so every time we, like if I'm at a, a ball game or any time I do the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm, I have those keys in my pocket, and I'm holding them, as I'm singing the Star Spangled Banner or, or anything that, of that nature to, remem to, to remember my grandfather. On the other side of this is the year. This was, this was unintentional when my dad gave me this. 1945 was when my, dad, when my grandfather was in prison, when he was taken into uh, captivity and, and imprisoned. Uh, actually, I miss, misspoke. 1945 was when he was, when he was released. When he was released, he was freed in 1945. And this coin reminds me that, in fact, I was f set free. I was, I was freed from the bondage of withholding forgiveness from someone that I didn't even realize that I was doing that. Uh, I'm grateful that God is gentle in his correction. Who do you need to forgive today? The second question that we want to ask, which is needed in order for you and me to not give up and not stop in Jesus' name, is this. Will you walk in power despite the intimidations? Will you walk in power despite the intimidations? But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear this message, excuse me, and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was great joy in that city. We talked about this last week, but we stop. We resign our position and authority in the culture as kingdom change agents when things get difficult. We stop. We resign our position and authority. Or when things get difficult, especially when the culture aggressively seeks to silence you and silence me, silence the truth. And then what we do is we, we conclude that then if that's the case, then God must be silent as well. And he, he certainly most likely doesn't care. We want God's promises with, without all the pressure and the pain. And, you know, God is so gentle. He's such a gentleman. This is in all of us. It's in our hearts. And God knows it. We often forget this truth. I love this image or this quote. God's silence is not God's absence. During the test, the teacher is always quiet. And that, kept, that came to me. I wasn't even looking for that. And God just dropped that this past week. And I said, thank you, Lord. Because even though we are scattered, we're not shattered. Even though we are tested, even though that you and I, you may be going through a test right now. And the enemy is just working and wreaking havoc to have you stop. 
You are tested, but you're not defeated in Jesus' name. To repeat, verse 3, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered, they preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. We have seen that Stephen is known as the first martyr. Interesting that Philip is known as the first missionary. Acts chapter 8 introduces Philip as the first missionary. And despite the intimidation and increasing threats from the Roman government and also the religious leaders, Philip walked in authority and power in Jesus' name, performing miraculous healings and deliverance from demonic activity. This was every day, 24-7. And Philip and the believers, they boldly shared the message of the good news. Will you walk in power despite the intimidations? And no one was going to shut Philip up. Nothing was going to stop or intimidate them or stop them in Jesus' name. And as Jesus' followers, and as followers of Jesus, we're not called to stay quiet. We're called to walk in power and boldness. And just this past week, I couldn't even believe it. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, this, this came across uh, one of the news feeds that I have and and I I mean of all things this was this was this was it Israel is proposing a law and it's called the Don't Say Jesus law uh, Israel the place the birthplace of Christ they're going to somehow propose this law now the current prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, is doing everything he can to stop this. But nevertheless, it's not going to stop those in his parliament that they think it's a good idea that what we need to say here, what we need to propose as a law, is if you say Jesus, you could be in prison for up to two years. This is what's being this is what's being proposed. Uh, not going to see that on our current news feeds, by the way. Not going to see that on the evening news. Um, and it's it's quite interesting when you when you think about this. The enemy is a liar, and anything that he uses to intimidate God's followers, ultimately in Jesus' name, it goes on deaf ears. But this law, you know, and 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 it's actually if you look at look at it deeper, they're they're saying it was all faiths, but they're specifically saying if you bring the good news of Jesus, you will be imprisoned. Nothing will stop us in Jesus' name. Amen? Will you walk in power despite the intimidations? The final and third question we want to look at and how you and I are going to continue and not stop in Jesus' name. This is the question. Are you available? Say available. Are you available in sharing the good news? At the end of chapter 8, we see God's assignment for Philip. And it's to keep sharing the good news wherever he went. That's the assignment. You see, when you pray, God, use me, God responds not as some one-time thing or this grand event as we often think. You see, God's way to test our motive and our hearts is to walk with us in steps, not slopes. He wants to walk with you in steps, not slopes. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, ski slopes, that's pretty slippery. And yes, the adventurous life that we call the journey with Jesus is, in fact, an adventure with all of its highs and lows. But Jesus wants to walk with you in steps as you continue to pray, God, use me. It's crazy when I think about this, and I have, to, I have this on the back of my, my notes, just as a reminder. When, when we took over uh, Living Water Church leadership back in July of 2017, Within a couple weeks, somebody who came as a guest speaker prophetically shared this word to uh, us and over Living Water Church in the moment and for the future. And so this is five and a half years, almost six years later. It still rings true. This was the prophecy. For God says, I am doing a new thing, bringing you into a new season. I'm binding up the broken. I am setting people free. I am pu putting the slander, the fear, and worry away for good. 
I am right in the middle of this transition. My presence is steadfast and bold. I want to do something mighty in the places for your community and this city. I have divinely put each of you, living water, your name is the fresh drink I want to pour out onto your city. Your community is thirsty, suffering from a deep thirst for life, and I've equipped you to step out. Step out, step out into the streets. Do not be afraid. Break down the walls. I don't see what you see, so I need you to take heed to my voice and do what I tell you. Do not be afraid of unconventional. Don't be afraid of different. Don't be afraid if what I'm doing and asking of you is counterculture to what you see other congregations doing. For I'm doing a new thing. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your elders. Lift them up and let this new thing I'm doing be in the open for all to see. I use the broken. I use the unequipped. I use the downcast so that I can get all the glory. Living Water Church, rise up. Go forth, be free. This is the new season you've been praying for. This is the season I have been preparing you for. Still rings true five and a half, almost six years later. Still rings true. And this is the call for you and I. Are you available? Am I in available? God's plan to use you depends on your availability. Are we, Living Water Church, are we available? God simply requires your yes, and then he takes you on the desired journey of sharing the good news. So God, keep using me even when it is difficult, even when you have me in a season of being tested, even when everything around me is telling me to stop, God, keep using me. As Philip sets sail in God's assignment for him, along the way he meets a man, and he's a eunuch, and he is, uh, he is a high official within the Ethiopian government, and he is the one in charge of the country's finance. This man was the treasurer of the country of Ethiopia. It turns out this man is reading the book of Isaiah while riding in his carriage, And Holy Spirit tells Philip to walk alongside the carriage, and this is where the story picks up in Acts 8, verse 30. Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this, and this is found in Isaiah 53, 7 to 8. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no judgment. How, who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Are you available? Am I available in sharing the good news? The good news that, yes, Jesus came and he died for your sin and my sin, past, present, and future, to give you life and to rescue you from eternal separation from the living God, that you can, in fact, have a relationship with him, and that he rose again Easter Sunday, and he is alive today, and he is all about making us changed in the image of his son. As the story goes, the eunuch decides to receive the good news. His immediate response was this, I just received Jesus. I gave him my heart. I gave him my life. I surrender my life to him. I have to get baptized now. This is what's happening in the story. And so Philip orders the carriage to stop. He says, stop, stop moving. And they find some water down the way, and they went down to that water, and and, and Philip baptized this man. Set free, baptized in spirit and in water. Have you been baptized in spirit and in water? Saying yes to sharing the good news and being available is signing up for an adventurous life. The best life, more than what you will ever think or imagine. Scattered but not shattered. Tested but not defeated. Nothing will stop us in Jesus' name. We are in this together. We are in this together. Finally, I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 to 12 from 
the message. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious, precious message around in the unad- unordor- unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us, trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. Let's stand and pray. As we take some time here at the end to to pause and consider... Uh, The questions that have been asked to us today, who do you need to forgive? Will you walk in power despite the intimidations? Are you available in sharing the good news? This is a time to pause. Uh, This was brought to my attention this past week. It's the word halt, a time to pause, so that we may consider halt H. Who do we hate today? We halt because the A is consider an inventory of the anger that's inside of us, or the loneliness, the L and the T, or that we're tired, to halt and to pause and to consider and ask God in his gentle way to bring us closer to him so that we may not resist and push him away or even cusp our ears and say we don't want to hear the truth anymore this is a time to respond and this question is for those who have not decided or surrendered your life to Christ today is the day of salvation don't put it off anymore nothing is guaranteed but what is guaranteed through Christ is eternal life because of his death on the cross, suffered a brutal death so that you and I could be forgiven all sins, past, present, and future. Have you decided to surrender your life to him? You can do that even now in the quietness of your heart. You can pray to him, God, I give you my life. I surrender my life. Take me on a journey to know more of who you are. I give you all my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that I can surrender my life to you. Some of us, we're, we've been on the cusp of time and time again just giving up. Listen, God is not done with you yet. He is not done with me yet. He is not done with us yet. And God wants to take us further. He wants to take us closer. And he wants to use you. He wants to use us for his great name. And so if that's you, if you've just been on this, you've just been really dealing with all kinds of things that are, that are causing you and the enemy's lying and saying, just, just stop already. Just, just, just bow out. Just be done. We're going to cast the enemy out in Jesus' name. And so Satan, devil, demonic oppression and accuser, we cast you out in the name of Jesus. We say no more lies, no more giving in to the accusations, and no more stopping what God has for me. And so leave in Jesus' name. You are not welcomed in the pursuit and passion 
of receiving Christ and continuing forward in this journey. And for the rest of us, this is our time to respond. And if you want to receive prayer for anything, please, please, don't, don't hesitate. Just come and pray over here. Come over here. Just run to the cross. And we want to join you because we're in this together. Father, we thank you for your, for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, God, for your word and for your Holy Spirit. And thank you, God, that you're always in the place of convicting and changing us. Father, we say yes today, yet again. For it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. So change us, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.